good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, I am going to talk about ransomware. We're going to talk about ransomware and actionable intelligence, how we can use cryptocurrency to assist us in really the due diligence that's required when we are looking at a ransomware case. Um, with the new, uh, especially within the US, we have new obligations. The US Department of Treasury has made it very clear, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit, that if you make a payment, a ransomware payment to an organization or a group that is sanctioned, right? So let's think back about WannaCry, which we all knew was North Korean. Um, if we make a payment, if an organization, a bank, a hospital, uh, a meatpacking company, Colonial Pipeline, make a payment to an organization that is in fact sanctioned, then the victim of the ransomware can be sanctioned for that payment. They can receive a sanctions violation for that payment, as well as anybody that helped them facilitate the payment, right? So the incident response firm or an insurance company or the cryptocurrency exchange that provided the crypto. And this can even trickle down to the bank level to where the banks can also be affected by this if they provided the initial funds that purchased the crypto that then went off and made the payment. So uh, what this really does is it levies on the victims themselves to do their due diligence ahead of paying a ransomware to ensure that they are not paying to a sanctioned organization. So crypto is one way that we can use that. We're gonna talk about that. Just ransomware in general, as we all know, um, has definitely had a banner year in 2021. Uh, the average payment was up 82% over the year um, to about $570,000. Um, so when we look at that compared to just a, a year or so ago, it was right around 320,000, 340,000, somewhere around there. And so we're up almost doubling the average ransomware payment. Of course, in the news, we've seen some high profile ransomware cases like Colonial Pipeline that paid you know, several million dollars. We also saw a German chemical plant, Brentag, that also made a very large payment, actually slightly larger than Colonial right around the same time. Um, so those are definitely some high profile cases that we've seen where the payments have been in the millions, right? Um, the targets remain the same. You know, We've seen everybody targeted from, again, a meat packing plant, a chemical plant in Germany, uh, colonial pipeline, then of course your typical banks, hospitals, schools, uh, local governments, right? Small businesses and even large corporations. So let's talk a little bit about dark side. It's a really good case study to take a look at. Um, one of the reasons why dark side made the news was because of their ransom attack against um, colonial pipeline, right? It made the news. Um, that's not typical for every ransomware case. Most ransomware cases really are addressed and kind of handled uh, behind closed doors. And a lot of that is due to the bank maybe or someone else, whoever the victim is. Um, they are very concerned that if the news gets out that they were the victim and that their data has been seized or encrypted in some way, and sometimes even often leaked before they even make the payment, then they worry about legal repercussions. Right. They worry about, am I going to be the victim now of also a class action lawsuit because my, victim, my, my client's data, right, my, my customer data has now been leaked in some way. So this is obviously a concern for them, not to mention any other type of re re repercussions they may have from investors or from shareholders or even from law enforcement. All right. So one of the issues that we have with ransomware is that we don't get a lot of good reporting on all the ransomware attacks that happen. Um, so working together, and this is going to be one of my key takeaways at the end, working together with public and private sector, right, there has to be this collaboration between the public and private sector, if we are going to really actually understand the entire weight of ransomware as it is in each of our economies, and then also on a global scale, we have, we're going to have to work together between public and private sector. So uh, Colonial, again, it was different, it was in the news, right? In the United States, we had people at gas stations taking plastic grocery bags and filling up gas in plastic grocery bags. When you see that kind of ludicrous activity, it tends to make the news. People get very concerned. People, especially in the U.S., get concerned when their gas, uh, when their petroleum, when their petro, right, is is being threatened. So, um, dark side. This wasn't their first case, right? They had been operating for quite a while. Um, this happened in May 
of just this past year. Um, but we had seen dark side for you know almost a, a, a year. We definitely seen them in the October, November timeframe of 2020. Um, they just had not gone after a super high profile target like Colonial Pipeline in this case. Now, what we can do and what one of the things that I really like to do when we're looking at ransomware groups is I like to go back in their earlier days and I like to trace their earlier fund movements. Okay, so one of the reasons why is because as we all know, criminals evolve and they get better as they go through, you know, just becoming a better criminal. And that includes their money laundering techniques, right? So in the earlier days of their operations, they tend to be sloppier. They tend to make mistakes. They tend to not understand the crypto enough to really launder their funds in a really efficient way. Um, understanding crypto, I always say this, you know, it's one thing to be a great hacker. That's, that's great. That's amazing. Um, it doesn't mean that you really understand the way that cryptocurrency works and the best way to launder it. Right. I mean, I've we, we've had conversations with with cryptocurrency investigators that have been working for two, three years, and they still don't fully understand UTXOs and why there's so many inputs into different things. So, you know, for a criminal to really get down to that granular level, um, it takes some time. It takes them a lot of practice. So if we can look at the earlier fund movements of a criminal organization, we can often glean a lot more intelligence from those earlier funds. So in the case of dark side, they they ran somewhere, somebody great. Um, let's go look at where their money is actually ending up, where they're sending their funds, right? That's what, those are some of the things that we want to look at. We want to start to build this profile. Um, as you saw on the previous slide, there was some information that we had about dark side that they were using, um, the like the default language in the systems to see if they, you know, had a default language of Russian, Ukrainian, Belarusian, that they would not execute the ransomware attack. So that led a lot of analysts to believe, hey, maybe they are Russian based. But we can also look at that as we look at their flow of funds. So here we have an exchange that is on the periphery of Russia. Here we have a high risk Russian exchange. And here we have Hydra market, which is you know the premier, it's been the dominating dark market in Russia for quite some time now. So we can see that the funds, as they kind of move around from dark side, the red circles are the dark side addresses. We can see that they are ending up in Russian or Russian adjacent entities, crypto entities, right? So that also gives us some good indication that, yeah, this seems to be right, that we're following that intuition that they are likely Russian based. Now, the big thing with dark side and everybody wants to know so i put it up here so we can walk through the case is uh there were some funds recovered from that colonial pipeline payment it was 75 bitcoin that were paid um and then of that 75 bitcoin they were actually able to recover 67 bitcoin it ended up being or, i'm sorry 60 64 more or less it was 63.7 um they ended up being 63.69 after the transaction fee and all that kind of good stuff but so of the 75, we got 63, and I say royal, we, US government got 63.7 back. Um, and the, re, the way that that happened was a little different than what we're accustomed to, right? Um, just listen to, to Scott's amazing presentation. And you know he's right, right? When we talk about exchanges, really we are looking to trace funds to an exchange most of the time. This case was really different because this did not involve any type of an exchange. It didn't involve any type of other crypto entity. The host government that actually seized the server was actually able to obtain the private key, right? So, and just so we're clear, it wasn't US government that seized the server. This was in another location that government has been, is, is undisclosed which actual government seized the private key. But this case is different because instead of seizing funds in exchange or going to an exchange and getting cooperation, they actually obtained access to the private key of the wallet that was holding the 63.7 Bitcoin. So just to walk through that here and how that looked, here's the actual seizure. You can see that 63.69 going out to the dark side fund, uh, seized funds address. That is FBI getting those funds back. Um, you can see, though, on the left hand side that the original seizure by the other government, the unnamed government, was actually 69.6 Bitcoin. Right. So what happened there was 
there were some other funds consolidated in. There's the seizure. Here's where we have some other funds. We have about 24, I think it's 24 inputs there. So a commingling of other funds from other sources that were commingled into that wallet that was ultimately confiscated, that was ultimately seized, the private key was obtained. And so then it was really interesting because then we had to have the FBI come in and say, well, how much of this is directly traceable to the 75 Bitcoin that was paid, right? Not all 69 of those Bitcoin were traceable to Colonial. So this is where you really have to be able to get down into the details and delineate how much of this Bitcoin that I'm ending up at, right, actually came from my victim. And we do this quite often in our investigations. We will have funds come in and commingle, right? We will have these consolidating transactions. And so then we have to get down and say, well, this percentage or this exact amount came back, came from my victim. I can trace that back. And this gets very technical, especially when you're testifying in court. So in court, I've had different ways that people have preferred for this testimony to have, whether it's percentage of that transaction or it's the actual breakdown of Bitcoin, if possible, of that transaction to really walk through those consolidated, those consolidating transactions that are happening. Here's the payment all the way back here of 75 Bitcoin. So you can see that it kind of bounced around. Now, one of the questions that you may have is, you know, how did they justify this? How did FBI go about getting this Bitcoin returned? They wrote up a warrant. Right, so in this document here, this is all public document from DOJ. Um, they very clearly wrote out that of that 69.6 Bitcoin, the 63.69, 63.7 is directly traceable to that 75 Bitcoin payment from Colonial Pipeline, okay? And you can also see very clearly in here that the private key is in possession of the FBI. So again, a little different than what most of us are accustomed to going through an exchange. But this also happens, right, quite often with law enforcement if they actually have an arrest and they actually come into physical possession of a wallet or of a private key, whether it's written down on a piece of paper or they come into possession of seed words or they come into possession of the actual um, apparatus, the hardware wallet, or they actually um, have a phone that they're side Xing, right? So there are certainly times that we come into possession of a private key. Um, what's really important for law enforcement, and this is where we work quite, quite, quite hand in hand with law enforcement in the U.S. to get, uh, and, and actually uh, abroad as well, um, to get them prepared for these situations so that they have a custody solution. Because once you come into possession of a private key of a hardware wallet or software, whatever, whatever you're coming to possession of, you can't leave the funds in that wallet, right? We can't leave the funds in the wallet that we found. We don't know who else has the private key, right? These are situations that we walk through. Do you do it on site? If you execute, if you execute a search of a property and you come across a private key, do you actually do the transaction on site? That's preferred, right? Because you don't know who else has that private key and may be moving the crypto at that very minute to get it out of the hands of law enforcement. Okay, so here we have just a really great example of how they're moving it. What was also really interesting in this case um, is that FBI DOJ made it very clear that they used publicly available blockchain explorers for this. They made it very clear in, in their affidavit that they used publicly available blockchain explorers only because that just simplifies any court case that they may have later on. They don't have to bring in a tool like CypherTrace or Chainalysis and walk through the other part of that proprietary information that they may or may not have used. In this case, I told you guys, there were no crypto entities involved. There were no exchanges that were passed through. There were no, you know, there was no attribution that was needed on any of these addresses. So they didn't really need a blockchain intelligence tool. They were able to use, quite frankly, public blockchain explorers. Okay, so a little different in that situation. Now, you may be asking yourself, out of 75 Bitcoin, how come we only were able to trace 63.7 to Colonial? Well, because if you remember, DarkSide is a ransomware as a service. Okay, ransomware as a service, that means the operators got 15% and the affiliates got 85%. So what was seized? It was the affiliates that were seized. Right? The affiliates funds were the ones that were seized 
the operators, here's their 11.2 or so Bitcoin from that 75 that they got paid. They were not affected by the seizure, okay? This is what we see quite often when we see arrest of ransomware operators, right? Ransomware groups. It's the affiliates that are being arrested. Right? The affiliates are kind of the ground soldiers. They're the ones out there knocking on the doors. They're the ones doing all of the um, heavy lifting to get into an organization. Okay, The affiliates also, too, are very financially motivated. They're very quick to want to spend their money. I always make a joke. You know it's an affiliate that was arrested if there was a Lamborghini that was seized. Right, They don't have that operational security to like withhold and kind of restrain themselves from spending their new riches on things like Lamborghinis. Um, whereas the operators are very much more methodical and they tend to not be as financially motivated, right? The famous, uh, the famous case we, that, that everybody talks about is in the case of NetWalker, the NetWalker ransomware group, the operators themselves, we've seen several arrests in NetWalker, but the operators themselves, they have a wallet, it's a cold wallet. They have 650 Bitcoin, 649 Bitcoin, sitting in a wallet. They haven't spent it. They haven't pulled any of that funds. They haven't pulled any of those funds out. They're very careful and methodical about it. Same thing with dark side, these 11.2 Bitcoin, they actually consolidate into 107 Bitcoin right up there at the top. They haven't moved, right? So again, very different techniques between affiliates and operators, okay? So that's where we see the split. Now you can also see it in this case, um, here's the that 107 Bitcoin. Here's one of the payments, the 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 Brent tag. Here's the Colonial. You can see right before that 17 circle right here. You can see the arrows are crossing. That's because the payments are crossing. So it was both the same affiliate and the same operator that executed the Brent tag and the Colonial pipeline. We can see the funds clearly crossing and the payouts taking place. Um, so just a little bit about um, just the the kind of the, the obligations that OFAC, right, Office of Foreign Asset Control, basically our sanction, uh, you know, the, the, US, the US Department of Treasury sanctions arm, um, they made it very clear last year that if you do affect a payment to a sanctioned actor, that that VASP and the victim themselves um, can be hit with the sanctions violation, right? So very clear, FinCEN are the US FIU, came out at the same time with the same guidance for virtual asset service providers with the same with the same warning, right? So um, very clear. Then we also saw some action in September of this year from OFAC where they sanctioned SUEX. Um, they are technically incorporated in the Czech Republic, however, believed to be um, and known to be mostly operated uh, for Russia and Russian users. Um, but they sanctioned the entire platform itself, 25 Bitcoin, Ethereum, and some other addresses. Um, and it was because they were able to say that about 40% of its overall trading was illicit, including from eight different ransomware strains. So this is the first time we saw an entire VASP be sanctioned, right? We've seen addresses, we've seen lots of wallet addresses put onto the OFAC list, OFAC SDN list, but we haven't seen an entire organization itself. And here's just some examples. Now, the challenge with SUEX is that it's a nested exchange. That means it uses a larger exchange. And I think we all know who that was. You, can, you guys can type these addresses in. It uses a larger exchange for its liquidity. And so those addresses actually don't belong to SUEX. They actually belong to the larger exchange, which complicates that for the other exchange, right? It's kind of like that correspondent banking. All right, so just really quick, my key takeaways. We have to be able to do this due diligence. One of the ways we're able to do this is to look at payments, look at past payments, right? That have been taking place with that ransomware group. Because when we all know when a victim gets that payment address, that Bitcoin or Monero, whatever it is, payment address, it hasn't been used, so it's not on the blockchain yet. So we cannot do blockchain analytics on an address that has not been used yet. Right, so we need to go back and look at previous payments. Information sharing is key. There's a lot of initiatives. Um, there was a meeting of you know 32 different countries uh, just a few months ago about ransomware, but also between private and public sector. That's really the way that we're going to be able to combat this. And then um, you know just the responsibility that this 
puts on institutions, insurance companies, instant response firms, and exchanges to do their due diligence. Thanks.